Welcome to the, um, the first in a series of um, kind of back-to-back -back adult ed opportunities we have here um, with SAR High School. Um, tonight, I'm going to be giving a shear from, you know, for the next like, you know, half hour or so, 35 minutes or so. And after that, um, Dr. Schwartz is going to be taking over me. Now, the idea is that in each of these evenings, each of these Wednesday evenings, we have these, we have planned shiurim followed by a, um, a teacher from, our, somebody from our Judaic study staff, probably somebody from our general study staff. Sometimes we flip that back and sometimes we'll flip that. And um, the themes are all going to be somewhat, you know, relevant to the current situation we find ourselves in the pandemic. So I see um, Dr. Schwartz is already in here um, uh, for, for session one. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, you missed it. I, I explained that, you know, with all great um, acts are usually have a have a, an opening act with a, some, a warming up the crowd for them. Um, so um, it's nice to see that you've even joined to watch the opening act um, before the uh, you know, in the audience yourself. So thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Um, all right. So today what I want what I want to speak about is a, a topic I'm going to call I, I think the title I'm going to give it now is called risk, reward and reopening. I am not going to talk directly or offer concrete suggestions about how the school should reopen or how society or the economy should reopen. I'm going to leave that to policymakers, politicians, departments of health. We're going to follow those directives as much as we are planning on, you know, all the possible contingencies. What I do want to kind of present to people this evening um, is perhaps some sort of way of thinking about this from a Jewish perspective. What are the categories within Jewish thought and halakha that we can sort of like mine to help us think about this very thorny situation? This is the topic that has very smart people um, on either side of the opening. We're op you're either opening too quickly, you're not opening fast enough, what are the issues? How does halakha see this? So I'd like to offer, again, not a, um, I'd say a direct halakhic analysis, but I'd like to look at a couple precedents of situations that I think are similar, that I think you might find interesting. And but in order to do so, let's get this show on the road here. And what I'd like to do is sort of, I'm going to be screen sharing a little bit um, with some text. You do not need to pay attention or read. You can just listen to me and follow um, along and ask questions. Uh, you do not need to follow the screen, sh the, the text that I'm going to put on the screen share. Um, alas, if you like to and go for it. I'm using this also just as, as uh, something to kind of keep me grounded and focused as we go through the, um, through the matter. Okay, so let's, let's, let's start a little bit here. Um, I'm going to, here we go. Um, if you take a look here, I want to talk, as, as I said, risk ward and reopening. Let's talk for a moment about, you know, Judaism's, I'd say, primacy it places on the idea of ensuring physical safety and saving people's lives. We all know this is a hallmark of Jewish practice and halacha. We know that we are very, very machmir, very, very strict on the idea of pikuach nefesh, of saving lives. Um, we will violate Shabbos to save somebody's life. We will do anything we can to save somebody's life um, except for the three uh, cardinal sins, but we will do anything we can to save a person's life. That is a primary value in Judaism. And we also know, I'm going to show you here, one of the sources for that is the Pasuk in Sefer Dvarim. It says, Vinishmartem, me'od l'nafshotechem. Oops, let me go back there. Hold on. Vinishmartem, me'od l'nafshotechem. Oops, let me get that over there. Hold on. Need to do that. Right? The idea is that you have to take heed to yourselves. And this is understood as, as being very careful and watching and taking care of, um, pay careful attention to your nefesh, to your soul, to your life. And therefore, you are required to be healthy. Torah sees this as uh, sort of maintaining our health as a, as a mitzvah. It's something that we have to be very serious about, and this is something that is, uh, it's a mitzvah. Now, I want to also point out that this comes up in another context. But I mean, I'm going to, you know, I feel, I don't like just talking at people, um, so I'm happy to sort of, uh, you know, kind of take a look in this chat. If, if somebody, you know, feels like, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll ask for participation, because anybody, can anybody think of, feel free to throw it in the chat, a mitzvah 
that you're familiar with that we are required not only to care for our own personal safety and our health, that's what, that's the nishmar temodon afshatechem, but a mitzvah that shows that we are required to be um, concerned for other people's um, safety and health. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, you know, look, to take a look at the chat box. You know, if you thought you were getting off easy by just sitting there passively and watching me, you got a thing coming to you. I'm going to, uh, I mean, oh, there you go. Andrew Small, excellent. Thank you very much, my friend. That is what I was looking for. It's almost like I planted you in the audience. Yeah, just to, that's also true, Nancy. Teaching your children to swim is, is, um, is also, it's a mission of Kedushin, says you're required to do that. Building a fence around the roof is a mitzvah in the Torah. And if you take a look, it's fascinating. I'm not, this is very small print. You don't have to read through all of this. Um, this is for, taken from the Rambam. The Rambam in his Mishnah Torah says, mitzvah ase lasot adam, it's a positive mitzvah to build a guardrail for your roof, right? The Pasuk says you have to build a, um, a, a fence around your roof. Now, the Rambam spends a lot of time in this parak, and I only included five halachot here, but it's like the whole parak basically shows different ways in which one is obligated to not just put a fence around his roof, but to do anything that would make his property safer um, so that nobody would be injured by it. So if you take a look here, I'm just going to, um, you know, you can, I'll go to the last halakha because I want to kind of like, you know, start moving here, get to the, get to the meat, of, meat of, the, of the shear. Um, look at halakha, hey, the Rambam says, um, harbei devarim, um, oh, let me say there are many things that our sages forbade because it has, because it, they're dangerous. And anybody who violates them and says, I'm just going to endanger myself. Right? And it doesn't really matter to other people. Right? Oh, any makpid bichach, or I'm not going to be that careful. I'm going to be, I, I'm not very, um, I'm, I'm not very risk averse. Makino to makat marduk. This is something, it's not in your, like, you know, uh, you're not allowed to take your life into your own hands like that. This is not, this is not your prerogative. You have to be careful. You have to make sure that others aren't going to be injured. And you also have to make sure that you yourself are not um, subject to any sort of, um, any sort of danger. Now, this is, and again, I could, I could spend the next 45 minutes going through many, many mikorot that show how much Judaism values um, placing our safety at the forefront and not engaging in risky behavior and not being, um, you know, uh, sort of lax about public safety measures. There is, I, I could go on for on and on and on. But I'd like to show you something who just, uh, yes, Yafa Fuchs, correct. Pikuach Nech, that is correct. Pikuach Nefesh is Docha Shabbat. So that is, again, that supports this idea that the Torah tells us that you are, no matter what, you should be very, very careful about preserving life. I will point out, though, it gets a little bit, a touch more complicated. If you, um, actually, you know, let me go back. Hold on one second. Um, I want to show you that it does get a touch more complicated because, you know, actually what I'm going to do is like this. Let's take a look. There is a concept in the, in halacha, um, which is fascinating. And I want to try to understand this with you. I'm gonna, it's all in Hebrew on the screen. If you understand the Hebrew, great. If you don't understand, that, I'm going to explain everything. Don't get frightened. Okay. The Gemara cites in five different places, a concept that is very strange. The concept is, I'm going, to, I'm going to say it in English. I'll read, say it in Hebrew and explain it. Kevan didashu beirabim shomer p'tayim Hashem. When the Gemara talks about, there are a couple of several different um, sort of like behaviors that seem very risky, that seem very dangerous. But the Gemara says that, you know what? Since people engage in this risky behavior that is dangerous, we say it's okay it's not a big deal. Shomer p'tayim Hashem. We quote the pasuk at Tehillim, which says that God watches out for those who are, um, you know, simple. 
In other words, if there are situ and I'll give you, I'm going to quote for you what these two cases are, just two of these five cases, because they're very interesting, and they're going to serve as something of, uh, they're going to form the background, the foundation for our discussion here this evening. Um, so if you take a look, I I'll just read it very quickly. Um, the two cases I'm quoting for you from Masechet Yevamot. The Gemara says, the Gemara says, generally, there is a prohibition against using um, methods of birth control, according to the Gemara. And the Gemara, though, says there's a bit of a dispute. There are three women that the Gemara says, um, again, this is using, uh, you know, uh, let's say, um, birth control methods from the, uh, you know, from the fifth century or so, maybe a little early, fourth century um, in, you know, uh, in, in uh, Persia. So, um, or, or, or yeah, Tani Rav Bibi, Kamei de Rav Nachman. Shalosh Nashim Misham Shot Bemoch. There are three different women who we allow, who I allow to use birth control, use contraception. Um, Katana, uh, a minor, of a young, I mean, this was back in the day when a minor could get engaged, could get married. A Meuberet, or a pregnant woman, or a Minika, or a woman who is nursing. Um, and the Gemara gives different reasons as to why. They, again, reasons that we would know today are not medically um, sound, um, but it gives reasons why it would be dangerous, mortally dangerous, for these women potentially to, um, to, to engage in sex without contraception. Uh, that's the opinion of, that's what the, the Rav Bibi says in front of Rav Nachman. If you take a look, though, that, excuse me, that, that Gemara quotes that in the name of Rav Rebbe Meir, Divi Rebbe Meir. But the rabbis say, No, no, no. No need for birth control. God will take care of it. You don't have to worry about this danger. Because the Torah says, the second says, God watches out for you. You don't have to be too, too worried about the risks. I'm going to give you one more case, then we're going to talk about this. Another case, the Gemara says, and there are five of these cases, the Gemara has reasons to believe that, give, that, um, that uh, on certain day, uh, based on, the, on like, you know, uh, bad weather, it would be dangerous to give a Brit Milah. Um, and the Gemara says, Rav Papa says that on a cloudy day, on a Yoma de Iva, a Yoma de Shuta, a day in which there was a particular kind of wind, like Loma Halinam Bay, we shouldn't... Um, give bris meal on those days because as the Gemara previously suggested, it seemed to be very risky to the baby's life. Below Mesuchrin, similarly, it seemed to be a day in which there was danger, mortal danger to people's life for those who would bloodlet back in the day. But Haidna nowadays did Dashu Barabim, since many people do it, Shomer Ptoim Hashem, don't worry about it, God will take care of us. Okay, now I wanna pause there for a second and talk about this with you, okay? Now, hold on. Uh, I'd like to stop the screen share and just ask you a question. Isn't this odd? How do you make sense of these two values that seem to be at very heavy tension with each other? On the one hand, we're suggesting Judaism is super strict about making sure that we never enter any kind of dangerous situations. We are always very careful about life and death. We don't take any risks. You're not allowed to engage in any kind of um, any kind of like possible uh, life uh, you know, threatening activity. The ma'ake, you have to get rid of anything that somebody might get injured. That's one hand. How is it possible that we also say shomer p'tayim Hashem? Yeah, don't worry about it. God will take care of you. You can be risky, engaged in risky behavior. It's very odd. In fact, I want to sort of use these two categories and explore them and see how they sort of like might shed a bit of light for us to think about um, what I started off with when we talked about sort of risk allowance, this idea of, you know, um, also an, an idea of reopening the economy, schools, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to highlight this by showing you the, a minute video. It was, it was a very poignant um, and I thought well-stated video. I, I know that, you know, lots of people have, uh, you know, really uh, sort of almost like coronated uh, Andrew Cuomo uh, to be the, you know, public health expert and his uh, press conferences are very well, um, you know, well-reviewed by many people. Um, I want to show you, last week he had a, an excerpt from one of his press conferences. It's a minute long. 
he sort of puts this issue out in very, very clear terms. And it's worth looking at that. I want to share that with you. I think you'll enjoy it. And it's going to help frame the rest of our conversation for the next 20 minutes or so. So I'm going to, I'm going to share this video, watch this video with me. One minute long. Uh, hold on a sec. Okay. Um, here we go. When you accelerate the reopening, you will have more people coming in contact with other people. You're relaxing social distancing. The more people in contact with other people, the higher the infection rate of the spread of the virus. The more people who get infected, the more people die. We know that. And that's why the projection models are going up. There's a cost of staying closed. There's also a cost of reopening quickly. That is the hard truth that we are all dealing with. And let's be honest about it. And let's be open about it. And let's not uh, camouflage the actual terms of the discussion that we're having. And the question comes back to how much is a human life worth? I thought that was great. That really is what it comes down to. In other words, peep the, I, I, and I think that, you know, I want to, I want to, you know, how much is a human life worth? We know it is of, of course, of, of infinite and estimable value, but how do policymakers make these sorts of decisions? Ultimately, of course, it would be safer for us to remain in our houses you might argue, for, for a very, very, very long time, months. But is, if we were to be guaranteed, like I, I'm asking this question as, a, as inquisitively and, and, and innocently, if the policymakers were to tell us that if we opened everything up across the country, we would probably have, you know, 100 people die in the next six months. I think that policymakers would say, okay, then you open it up. Uh, but why? How, how do we make these categories? Like, how, how do we make the decision uh, uh, as to whether or not we would open something up if somebody inevitably is going to, is going to face mortal danger? So I want to, sh this, this, this whole idea, like, you know, we start wrapping your head around and saying, well, how is this different than that case or that case? You begin to get, you know, your head begins to spin. Why is it that halacha allows us to drive cars? Well, what's the reason? Um, the, hold on a second. I just got a private chat. Did you guys not hear the video? Nancy Luria, give me a thumbs up. If you, did you hear the video? Oh, you did hear the video. Okay, so whoever, the, so again, thank, thank you for the concerned citizen who said they couldn't hear the video. Um, I'm happy I asked that. Um, it was just, it seems to be, turn up the volume on your computer. Um, but I appreciate you looking out for me because that, that would have been, that would have been bad. The, um, but th and, and I would have been very surprised by the docile uh, listeners who were just nodding and watching Andrew Cuomo. Either that or you were good, like, you know, you're good at reading lips. Now, the question though is like you know these are these kind of questions like uh, I've, i began like you know spinning my head around this like driving cars is really dangerous so why why does everybody in the world agree that you're allowed to drive cars like why is that okay so i want to think about that a little bit more in just a moment but i want to show you something that was quite brilliant was quite excellent um i want to show you one more thing uh, a couple more things. Take take a look at this um, at this piece here. So um, the RCBC, the Rabbinical Council of Bergen County, has really been quite excellent in um, in, in their responses to to the pandemic. I mean, they've really been. Hold on a second. I apologize. I think my you know. Okay, hopefully my internet's okay. Um, the, the, the RCBC has been has really been fantastic. They have given 
Um, really great guidance. They closed schools down early. They came out last week with a very interesting statement that I wanted to share with you. And I wanted to think about what, to the extent to which we actually think that this is, um, that this is necessarily true. I'm curious about this. The RCBC talks about when they might open the schools. I want to read, it, it, it's a really great letter. I want to read it with you. Um, this is only part of it, but the, the, you know, it's worth Googling, going over the RCBC website and reading some of the, um, some of the positions, the papers they've put out in the statements of, uh, of like policy. So take a look at this. Um, as Jews living in the modern world, we are mandated by the Torah to navigate the tension between our unique and singular identity as a Jewish community on the one hand and as engaged citizens of the broader community on the other. Both of these represent aspects of a religious mission. Sometimes the tension is navigated effortlessly, while other times it's fraught with complexity. This tension is evident in our relationship with the current pandemic, and I would like to highlight two ways in which our reaction is and should be unique. One is fundamental and one is practical. We're just gonna look at the fundamental one. And again, this, uh, this statement is signed by the uh, president of the RCBC, who happens to be Rabbi Kenny Shiowitz, um, husband of our very own Ms. Shira Shiowitz. Um, so fundamentally, the sanctity and value of human life is a cornerstone of Jewish law and thought, right? In this regard, we have much in common with the general society, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna read, go to the next paragraph. At the same time, it's important to appreciate the ways in which the Jewish value on human life may be unique. Consider the fact that our Jewish community shut the doors of our schools and shuls in advance of the rest of our society, though I wish we would have acted even earlier. Why did this happen? Are we wiser? Were we better informed? Unlikely. I believe that our swift and sweeping response was primarily due to the primacy halakha places on the preservation of human life and the extent to which it towers over every other core value we hold. Our communal leadership and the rabbis of the RCBC considered the question of how many lives must be endangered. This is the key part I wanted to show you. How many, of our, how many lives must be endangered to justify the closing of all of our religious institutions? The answer, one. Our tradition teaches that creation originated with one individual person to teach us that one person represents an entire world. Saving one life is tantamount to saving an entire world. Some people thought that a rabbi showed great courage and a lack of flexibility in shutting down our communal institutions to compromise on so many of the laws and rituals that are part of our daily lives. In truth, the exact opposite is true. The rabbis followed our long stringency in our obligation to preserve life. Now, uh, this is fascinating. You know, I, I, get, I think it's like a really interesting, um, yes, I, Rivka Schwartz, that's not a bad point in the chat. I think we closed before everyone else because our community was the epicenter of the outbreak, not because of our values. Okay, that's, that's fair. I'll let you argue with the RCBC. Um, but I think that it's also, I wanna like pick at that point a little bit. I think it's true. We hold that, you know, um, that one light, that you're saving the whole world. One person's life is of, 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 is of infinite value. But is that, what? Is that really going to be the criteria? Are we going to keep shuls closed until we're certain that not a single person in the country might die from the virus? I just don't think it's true. Because I, I actually, <laughs> this is it's gonna sound macabre and I apologize for it. I, I, tech, I was talking to a friend of mine who said that if that mentioned to me that his wife's uncle was, again, this, 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 is, uh, this is awful, mentioned to me that his wife's uncle was knocked over um, on the way to a, uh, at, the, at a kiddish table, fell down, and I mean, you're not gonna, I, he said never, he did not recover from the fall. In other words, there, by, de, by its very nature, being a person in the world involves risk. So certainly there is some risk. Somebody across the country is going to catch an illness and will, it would, if you go out in public, if you open our schools, open our schools, the criteria is hard to believe that it's saving one life. But let's explore this a little bit. And I've got 15 minutes and I'm totally not gonna make it, but I'm gonna figure out what I'm gonna cut. So I wanna look at very quickly with you um, a couple of interesting cases. One of them is a, is, is a case of, um, of, of, um, of abortion, actually of birth control, of birth control. And it's a case that was sort of like, you know, looked at by different post scheme in the late 19th century. Um, this first question was asked of Jakob Ettlinger, a, a major post in Germany. 
And the second one was, and it was asked, same exact question asked of Chaim Ozer of Grudzinski in Vilna. Okay? Now, same exact question was asked. The question was, the doctors said that um, this woman, if she were to become pregnant, she would be putting her life at danger. So could she use contraception? That was the question that was being asked. Now, what, how do you approach that answer? Well, I'll tell you what Rav, Rav, Rav Etlinger said. Rav Etlinger said she cannot use the contraception because, alas, why should she be able to use the contraception? Shomer p'tayim Hashem, he says, um, it, you know, how do, you, you're not allowed to, you know, this is not considered to be a, an invalid risk of your life. The Shomer p'tayim Hashem, not a big deal. God will take care of you. You are not, this is not considered to be risking your life. You can engage in this risky behavior. Um, it's not such a big deal because after all, Shomer p'tayim Hashem, you would only, we would say you can't engage in this risky behavior when Rev. Etlinger says, if the danger was imminent, since you might get pregnant, and if you get pregnant, you might put your life in danger. Therefore, he says, I don't consider that to be um, subject to suffix pikuach nefesh. And therefore, I, I employ the idea of shomer p'tayim Hashem. You could be risky. You don't have to be so super, um, you know, uh, risk averse. Reb Chaim Ozer, though, says, no, no, no. That's not the way we understand it. Shomer p'tayim Hashem, let's be honest. It's not negating the primary value of suffik pikuach nefesh, of you're not sure if your life is in danger. Of course you have to save a person's life. Why? What is the idea? You must use contraception, says Rav Chaim Ozer. The only time we say shomer p'tayim Hashem is if it's a very, very chashash rachok, he says. A small, infinitesimal possibility that a person will be uh, putting their life in danger. In that situation, we say, Shomer P'tayim Hashem. You don't have to be a Meshuggan, a crazy person, like, you know, wrapping yourself in bubble wrap uh, when you go outside. Be a regular person. If something is like, you know, that's why we say, Shomer P'tayim Hashem, be a regular person. But of course, if there's a real possibility, doctors are telling you your life's in danger, you can't take your life into your own hands. What are you, crazy? He says that the Revetlinger thinks the Revetlinger is wrong and thinks the woman would have to engage in, contra would have to use contraception. Now, let's think about the next case I want to show you. Um, next case is a famous case. And like, you know, um, I think there's some doctors on this. And this is, a, this is great, this, this case. So it's fascinating that in 1964, um, the Ramosha Feinstein was asked a question. Um, are you allowed to smoke? Can you smoke? So there is, a, and if I, if I, it would be a fascinating um, historical halachic conversation to look at how um, different, you know, Jewish uh, post scheme and different thought, uh, you know, thought leaders, uh, you know, really in the early days of tobacco, uh, thought it was like a wonderful elixir, it like helped you with your digestion, they encouraged people to smoke. Okay, in 1964, Rav Moshe was asked about it, and he said, you know, it's, I can't tell you it's us or Shomer p'tayim Hashem. People basically do it. It doesn't seem like it's um, 100%. It doesn't seem like it's dangerous. You're allowed to do it. This is 64. They asked him again in 1981. Do you want to reverse yourself now that the, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the lung association, all of the, you know, um, doctors have pointed out the research is that you're going to get lung cancer. It's very likely you're putting your life in danger. Can you forbid smoking? And Rav Moshe still held that he didn't think that it was considered to be categorically usser. He thinks you should not do it, but he didn't say, he thought that you could still rely on the idea of Shomer P'tayim Hashem because lots of people were doing it and it wasn't a definite that you were going to get lung cancer and that you were going to die from it. Therefore, he said, I don't think you should do it. It's not great. It's a bad habit. But Rav Moshe, in his writings, did not forbid it. Now, there are people who say Rav Moshe changed his mind. He actually, later in life, said, you really shouldn't smoke, and it is an answer. But in his writings, he didn't say it. He said, Shomer P'tayim Hashem. Now, Rav Moshe was argued, uh, was argued with by the Tzitz Eliezer of Eliezer, Wal Eliezer Waldenberg, 
of Ram Yushalayim in 1982, just a year after Rav Moshe was asked this question. He was asked the question. He said, Rav Moshe's crazy. How's it possible? You could say it's mutter to smoke. All of the doctors point out, all the researchers pointed out that you're likely going to get lung cancer. You're certainly at a high risk for lung cancer. Shomer Ptaim Hashem, he says, is a concept you can rely on if the evidence seems to support you. If, however, we see people dying from lung cancer, you can't say, oh, Shomer Ptaim Hashem, God will take care of it. God's not taking care of you. People are dying from lung cancer. So, of course, it's usser. This would be a violation of it is forbidden, says the Tzitz Eliezer. You cannot smoke. It is forbidden. Now, I want to show you my, I actually am going to finish it at, at, by, by 840. And it's going to be perfect. Now, this, let's just talk, I want to ask you one more opinion, and then I want to tie it all together and talk with you guys about it. The last opinion I want to show you, it's fascinating. This is a fa- I, I, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I, I feel like, you know, I'll be transparent here. I was I'm very unfamiliar with the writings of Yehuda Silman. Yehuda Silman is a contemporary post-sake in B'nai Brak. He's a very, fa- I, 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 until I started researching this, I had not heard of him. I did a little Googling. He's, a, he's got a lot of interesting opinions. He seems to be, uh, you know, he, he's very interesting in some of his, some of his approaches to um, halachic matters. Um, this was, like, I, I, I loved what he said and hated what he said at the same time. He got, he's talking about smoke. Question was asked of him, can you forbid smoking? And he go and goes into an analysis of when do we say, Shomer P'tayim Hashem, that you could be risky? When do we say you have to be risk averse, you cannot be risky? How, how do we figure this out? I want to read for you the Hebrew and just explain it for a second. Hadavar nimdad. The, uh, the matter is measured, lo al pi statistica. It's not, not, it's not um, measured by statistics. She'im shumze, lo ayyot mo'il bazerov. There's no, um, you know, whoever just unmute, to mute everybody. Hold on a second. If you would mute yourselves, people. Okay. I just muted. Okay. Um, Okay. Now, if um, he, it's not al pi statistica, she be shuzel loyal mo was a rub. The Hashim pikuach nefesh aflamiut. If we're going, when we're worried about pikuach nefesh, someone's life is in danger. We worry even about a small. It's not like if most of the time you die, we say no. But if forty nine percent of the time you would die, we say oh, it's okay. It's not based on statistics. We we we're worried about even a minor a minor chance that you might be endangering your life to say something's forbidden. Um, so let me just read a little bit more. Bechagon Maka Shabarzel. Similarly, a person was uh, injured by a piece of iron. Like you, I guess you may have tetanus. This is time, time back back in the day. Shinira um, Shigambis Manav. Even back in the time of the Gemara. Harov Meila Shikiblu Maka Kaza Hayu Chayim. Most people would live. Ella Hadin Nikpa Lefiyachas Bnei Adam. Listen to this, please. The idea, the the rule is established by what? The yachas bnei adam, the matter in which human beings, communities relate to it. The chol bnei adam ro'im bo chashash sakana asur. If people see it as having, being dangerous, being life-threatening, it's forbidden. V'im ein regilim l'tyachese la b'sakana. If they don't relate to it as if it's dangerous. Af sheish bo achuz lo pachot shel zikun. Even if it statistically is dangerous, has some danger to it. Shari, it's mutar. Most people don't react to it, he claims. Maybe it's B'nai Brak is different than in our neighborhoods. Um, he says most people don't react to it as if it's B'kuach Nefesh. You don't run away from a cigarette as if it's like, you know, uh, a, so, as if it's poison, okay? Therefore, he says, I can't forbid it. But here's the interesting part. I can't forbid it on halachic grounds, but that, that still, you shouldn't do it. And it, the question is asked of me, he said, should I forbid somebody smoking? Is it usher to smoke in a Beit Midrash? He says, I can't tell you that by the letter of the law, it's halachically forbidden, but you shouldn't do it. There's another way to forbid it. There are like 
uh, board members. There are gabayim. There are people who are in charge of the Beit Midrash. They should make a rule and say, in our Beit Midrash, no one's allowed to smoke because it's disgusting. Uh, but I can't tell you that it's forbidden because this, and this is what I think is what's so interesting. His category of Shomer Ptayim Mashem is fascinating, and I think I find it the most compelling. He basically says, you trust people's way of looking at things. If people react to driving cars as if it's like not a big deal, then it's mutter. Shomer Ptayim Hashem. Uh, you're going to tell me that you looked up on the National Trafty Safety Board that it's more dangerous to drive a car than it is to uh, go uh, bungee jumping, right? Or, or whatever, the, whatever the things are. Yeah, yeah but that's not the way pe people don't react. The human beings don't live life as if driving cars is something that scares us. It doesn't give us a chashah sakana, and therefore, halacha views that as being allowed. Now, I thought that was interesting about, what I, here's what I loved about it, here's what I hated about it. What I hated about it is that we know that people are notoriously awful at judging risk. Of the, people engage in risky behavior. They do dumb things all the time, right? So that's why there's something that's like, you know, almost, you know, um, like depressing about this approach. But what's interesting about the approach is that it does give some, it's a little bit like, you know, almost, almost like a little bit democratic in the way of understanding how we make these decisions. And I think that, you know, looking at this idea of Kevin Dudashu Bey Rabin, um, perhaps as a category, it is different than the category of, uh, you know, of when we're always very strict about making sure our lives are safe. Perhaps this is something to think about what, as a category in halacha, when we think about how, whether we open the economy, what, what rate we do these things. Again, I, it's obvious that we're not at that place right now, but I also think that it's, it's clear that there's something to be said for Kevin Dadashu Bey Rabin, that they're putting some trust in, in the community in the, in, in, as well as, as they're guided by specialists. So okay, I just wanted to point out, I think that, you know, we looked at a few different approaches, whether it was different approaches about um, using contraception and a woman's danger, taking a woman being, uh, having her life be in danger versus smoking. Perhaps the way that halakhic authorities addressed these issues and looked at the tension, the real tension between not being risky at all, Judaism placing the primary value on saving one life, is, as the RCBC pointed out, but also recognizing that there is an element of Shomer Ptayim Hashem of Kevin Dadashu Bey Rabin, that our criteria, the threshold for like permitting certain behaviors is not absolute certainty. There is some gray area there that will be ultimately left to, to policymakers. So I don't know, that, that's, I, I talked a lot. I've talked at people. I don't usually love doing that. Hopefully I gave you a little bit of food for thought as we can continue thinking about um, these, these very, you know, weighty matters um, as people, I'm glad that, you know, um, you know, in the early days of this pandemic, the school was figuring th these things out because we were the first people dealing with it. At this point, now that the entire world is managing it, um, there is something that is uh, reassuring, hopefully, that it's not all on our shoulders, that we are looking uh, to the experts who will be guiding our decisions as we move forward. So I want to thank you for joining me. I'm